What does the Bible say? Philippians 1, 27 through 2, 11. In this text, Paul treats, is trying to help the church understand itself um, as a community of moral conversation. Um, and I'm, as we go through this text, I'm going to be pointing out some uh, words uh, that in the English translation, sometimes it doesn't come, quite ac come across quite as plainly as it should. Um, but I'll try to make a case uh, that Paul is using a lot of um, political language in this text. And uh, for him, and for his, uh, for his age, and for his audience, uh, uh, anything that has to do with politics has to do with speaking because people conceived uh, political action uh, not as something that was done secretly, but primarily something that was done openly and publicly, and uh, people speaking to one another. So look at 127. This is where we want to start, Philippians 127. In your texts, uh, I think you probably have something like, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or no, it's just Christ. When you hear that, who is the you in that passage? Does, when you hear the word you in that passage, do you hear a singular you, mm -hmm. or do you hear, a, like in the South, you all? I hear a you all, a collective. You hear a collective, yeah, yeah. Because the letter is addressed to that's, the church. Right, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, that's one of the tough things about reading uh, Paul's letters is with the word you. In, in English, we don't have a way of distinguishing that, but in Greek, there's a very clear way, and in Greek, it very much is a you plural. And then the next, the next thing is very important. Uh, the word that, that you have for let your manner of life be worthy, or what was, what was yours, Jim? It says only live your life. Only live your, your life. Worthy of yeah, the yeah. Christ. Well, let me show you on the board. The word in Greek is politeuiste. Now, do you hear a word in there that sounds familiar to you? Polis, politeuiste. Yeah, right here. Yeah, the Greek, uh, the T, you can mess around with that. We would hear an S, and uh, we would have an S there. But the point here is that the, the whole word is built upon the Greek word Polis, like in Minneapolis, which means city. Now this word politeuiste is a really interesting word. It's used a lot in uh, political discourse in Paul's day and in the three or four hundred years before Paul wrote. What it means is something like uh, engage yourselves politically in the life of the city. When, uh, when people grew up and got to be about the age of 19 or 20 or something like that, uh, it was said that they would begin to pull the chewest thigh. They would begin to be active, active participants in their city life. And the, um, the idea that stands behind this, the sort of political system that sits behind this, is the notion of democracy. So in the context of a democracy in which the future of the city is um, determined by people's speech with one another in an open setting, um, not through power plays, but through speech and conversation and persuasion. This word politeus, I has its, I think it has its um, kind of home meaning or original meaning. Surely one of the most significant things that happened as, as we've been talking in this Bible study is that there was conversation. People would be face to face with each other frequently. They would work and, and sell from the same location. Often their families would live at that same location. So interaction with kinfolk and customers and fellow workers would just be a natural part of everyday life. You have to keep in mind that these ancient cities were uh, generally formed according to a plan fit as closely as possible to the very varied topography, the shape of the land on which they were built. Usually the roads were in a grid system. There would be two main roads that would cross each other, big gates at the place where you come in and go out, and we know that from the Bible. We hear lots about city gates there. And then um, 
always, if it was any kind of a town worth talking about, a theater where the whole town could gather for major events, um, a temple complex at one end of the forum, and the forum would be the place where everybody would gather to do buying and selling and probably a little manufacturing as well, and who knows what kind of flirtation and uh, marriage making went on there. So, gymnasia, theaters, temples, government buildings, and colonnaded stoas provided the open space where people did most of their business. What it means then is Paul is asking every one of his hearers in Philippi to think of themselves as participants, as active speech participants in this community. That's really different in some ways, that's different from, uh, that is quite different than the experience that they would have in their everyday lives. Women, for example, were not granted free speech, children, slaves, so on and so forth. So one of the radical things that's going on here is that that word is addressed to everyone that, has, that is hearing uh, this text. Okay, next move, to make the political move. Within the city, now let's see, let's have a picture here. Within the city, let's say that's the whole city population. Within the city, you have a subgroup of people. This is in the ancient Greek context, um, called the assembly. The assembly was uh, the gathering of the free persons, persons who are free. Yeah, you see, ev not everybody in the city, this is one of the problems, not everybody in the city was invited to make these decisions together through speech. Uh, only the, oh, actually, only, it was only the uh, uh, males and you had to own a slave. Now, I, I want to be real careful here. This is not, Paul is not advocating any of this, but he's borrowing language that's taken from this culture that is forged. Um, uh, this language comes about in this context. So it's, 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 we have to understand the context, understand the language. So uh, people would come, uh, 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 males who owned slaves would come to the assembly, and it's the assembly uh, is the place where uh, they did their speaking with one another and determined the future of the city. Now, the word for assembly, this is getting to be kind of a mess here, but the word for assembly in Greek is, uh, well, that's English too, isn't it? Ekklesia. Uh, maybe go something like that. Ekklesia. Now, does that word ecclesia ring any bells? You hear, we get the word ecclesiastical, so on and so forth from it. But this is the word always in Paul, Paul's letters. It gets translated church. So what that means is that Paul and the people that he's writing to understand themselves as a group of persons who are called out, maybe you can think of it that way, but a group of persons who are members of an assembly who determine their future through speech. So even the name that they call themselves, we're the church, it doesn't ring any bells for us, but when they said, we are the ecclesia, well, that means that they understand themselves as a speaking community. What's different, of course, is is that it was not just for, for the Pauline congregations, it was not just the males or the, the slave owners who were parts of this assembly, but Paul is very clear on the fact that in Christ there is neither male, female, slave, nor free, all of that, so that uh, in the assembly those kinds of distinctions fall away. One of the words that you hear in Dave Fredrickson's Bible study, Ecclesia, comes into play in that governing of ancient cities. Most ancient cities, as I understand it from my reading, had two layers of government. There would be a council or boule, 
which would meet in a particular council house, and then there would be the larger assembly of freeborn males. Usually you had to be a property holder to be part of that ecclesia, so it wasn't just any old person who got a chance to be part of it. By means of simply shouting, they often made the council attentive to their wishes. And you can get all kinds of examples of that from Roman government, but you can read the book of Acts and find out how when the citizens become irate in Ephesus and drag Paul off where to the theater because the ecclesia was too big to meet in some enclosed area, they are able to get the magistrates to come to the theater to try to calm things down and apply proper procedure and do all the things that counselors should do. You also see quickly how important it was to be free. And one of the highest ideals for Greco-Roman society was to be able to speak freely and boldly with one another. The ideal relationship where this happened was between friends. We need to move to the second part of things now. Uh, we need to look at the point in the Christ hymn, um, rather at the beginning of it, in 2.5, um, where we run into this notion of Christ's, Christ Jesus' equality with God. This is a major idea uh, in the Christ hymn, and it makes a big difference how we understand this. Um, if you look at 2.5, it says, Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Uh, in the ancient world, there were two ways of thinking about equality. Uh, we'll go theory number one and theory number two. In theory number one, equality was a matter of substance. That is, um, if we have, uh, there's seven of us, three, five, six of us, if we have six of us and uh, we have six donuts brought in, equality would be a matter of us all having the same stuff. That would be fair, that would be equal. Um, that's theory number one. When you, uh, theory number one, when you think about equality as a substance. There's another way of thinking about equality, and that is an equality of participation. In that way of thinking about equality, we would say that we have equality with one another if we ha all have equal access to participate with one another in this community that we have right with us right now. In other words, equality would be a matter of you having the same, you having a voice in this community, of you having a voice, of us all having a voice, and, and none of us being able to be shut out. So it's two different, very different ways of thinking about equality. This, this kind of equality is almost made out of stuff, and you just cut apart the stuff and make it equal. This kind of equality is a process, is a way of relating to one another. Now, it makes a big difference which kind of equality you have in your head when you read the Christ hymn. And what I think is just utterly, utterly fascinating is to make a move to read this kind of equality in the Christ hymn. That would mean that what Paul is saying here is that God and Christ Jesus, even though they're quite different, both of them have access to one another in conversation. And that what he's saying is that there is an original community made up of, original city, if you want to think of it that way, in which God and Christ Jesus relate to one another in a political way. That is, they speak to one another, and through their conversation, the future is generated. But if you, if you read the Christ hymn and think through the story of the Christ hymn in terms of, of, of process, then it's really kind of fantastic because that takes us to the next point. What is it that Christ Jesus does with his equality? It's not something that he grasps, but he empties himself and he becomes obedient to us. Well, I'm skipping ahead. He actually takes on the form of a slave in verse 7 and becomes obedient. I think that obedience is rendered to us. And if Christ Jesus is a slave to us, that makes us free. Let me show you how that works. In antiquity, uh, obviously they, they, had, they had slaves 
and they had masters or a slave master or the master is free. Now, how is it that a master is free? How, how did a master come to be free? You only became free if you had a slave because a slave does all of the work gathers the food, and prepares, you know, prepares food, organizes the household, so on and so forth, that frees the master up so that the master is able to go participate in the, in the assembly. So in order, in the ancient world, in order to be free, you had to have a slave. The slave makes the master free. It's even the slave's body that makes the master free. So, uh, what's going on in this text is that Jesus Christ does not try, no, Jesus Christ does not make us free by simply waving a magic wand over us and saying we're free. But what Paul is saying here is that Christ Jesus actually becomes our slave, becomes our, takes on our death for us, and that makes us free. And what's really, really radical about that is, if it's the case that he makes us free, who are we free with? We're free with, who was Christ Jesus free with? Who was he equal with? He was equal and free with God. So the whole movement of the Christ hymn is this movement of expanding the community. If you want to think about it in terms of a picture, what you have is, God and Christ, Christ Jesus in the original community. Christ Jesus, the second move is, Christ Jesus does not think his equality with God is something that's for himself, but he extends that through, to us through his own death, through his own slavery to us and for his, through his own death for us. And that makes us participants with God in a community. Now the story goes a little farther in verse 9. How does God react to all of this? God says to Christ Jesus, I like what you've done. And the point is that how is it that God reacts to Jesus' move? How is it that God reacts to Jesus making us free? God raises Jesus from the dead. God gives Jesus the name Lord. So you have this paradox that Jesus, who is our slave, is also Lord. Deep paradox. But the, the, the upshot of all this is, now that God is not someplace else having a conversation with Christ Jesus, but what's happened is, is that Christ Jesus has actually expanded that original community to include us. And notice, <laughs> never thought of this before, but notice what's still in the middle of all this. It's the notion of, death uh, and being a slave to another. And that is kind of what's going on in the Christian community. That we make other people, Christ has made us free through his death and we make other people free. We make people out here free by becoming slaves to them. So what's going on in the church, what's going on in moral conversation as we get more people involved in conversation and they feel bold enough to speak, what we're doing is we're actually making this circle bigger so that we can understand the mission of God in Christ Jesus as making this circle uh, the same size as the whole world. Yeah.